In your sewing road trip, there are some signs along the way that will definitely help you. Learn about pattern rules today on Fit to Stitch. Fit to Stitch is made possible in part by Husqvarna Viking, keeping the world sewing for over 140 years with innovations in sewing, embroidery, and quilting. Learn more at HusqvarnaViking.com. American and Eford, innovators of thread for all your sewing needs, makers of Intressa sewing thread. Learn more at SilhouettePatterns.com. Elliott Berman Textiles, manufacturer of fashion fabrics. ElliottBermanTextiles.com. No one will question that when we drive a car, it is critical that we need to know the rules of the road, i.e. a stop sign, a red light. Those things are pretty critical in our driving daily experiences. So anytime I talk to someone about patterns and sewing, they seem to think that, no, I don't want to know patterns. I just want to sew. It doesn't work like that. You can't drive without knowing the rules. You can't do patterns. You can't do sewing without understanding patterns. But they're not hard. There's so many different things I've taken on recently in my life. Computers are a great example. My son is just certain that I should learn computers, that to be an educated person, you, could learn, you should learn computers. When he was young, I told him to be an educated person, you need to know music, and now he's turned that full circle on me. So I've had a few computer lessons from him, and I'm going to tell you something, it's helped a great deal, even though I went, did it kicking and screaming. As adults, it's hard sometimes for us to learn, but we should know pattern rules. I'm going to make these so fun and simple for you, but you need to know them really in order to work with patterns. And when you learn them, what you'll understand is how much easier it will all become. So let's just learn the basics. There's two methods of making patterns. One is flat pattern and one is drape. So worldwide those are used and a lot of times they're used together so that one makes the other easy, et cetera, et cetera. Within flat pattern, there are two ways to do flat pattern. I strongly believe that the sewing industry is kind of befuddled with this whole fitting thing because we have learned methods of fit instead of learning patterns. We've learned alteration shortcuts and because we don't know the full understanding of what's going on in the pattern, the methods confuse us. Let me show you how to move a dart. It, it's absolutely clear that we've got to learn darts, we've got to learn to understand them, et cetera, et cetera. Whenever we go to deal with patterns, we've got five basic pieces. Those five basic pieces are the front, the back, the sleeve, the skirt front, and the skirt back. Those are it. Everything we make comes from those five basic pieces. And every garment we have has darts in it. It's simply a matter of what's been done to those darts. So the first thing we're going to learn is what do we do with darts? If we look at a shirt and if we say, but wait a minute, there is no darts here. There are, there's always darts. If I look at this t-shirt, I know it came from this base and I know that all that it did is the bust dart was moved to the waist and then released. And release just means it wasn't stitched. I can't leave the bust dart where it is. I can if I have to stitch it but I can't just leave it out because the side seams won't match. So whenever I see a garment that doesn't have a bust dart in place, I know it was moved. So with the bust dart, I only have two choices, and that's to either stitch it or move it. In this case, if it's not there, it's at the waist, it's been released or not stitched, and that's the final product. And we know that when we have this final product, that armhole is going to gap 100% of the time. So if we look at this first one where we have gathers in the front, those gathers are the bust darts. The bust dart has been moved to center front, and then in, instead of it being stitched as darts, it's just simply gathered up. So fitting darts become style in many of our garments. In this particular case, the bust dart's been moved to the shoulder, and it becomes a princess seam. Now, the reason it's important for us to know this is because when we go to make alterations, it's difficult to alter the dart once it's been moved. It should be really moved back, altered, 
and then moved in order for it to really be correct. And, and I'm going to give you an example of that. So let's look at how darts are actually moved. There's two ways. I told you there's two ways to do that. And let's go to the, um, to the paper. Okay, so for this case, all I'm going to do is make that top, and I'm going to move the dart, I'm going to move the bus dart to here. So that's actually where I start tracing. I want to hold this still. I want to trace around. And you can see the negative as to why this method isn't used a lot is because I have to make that tracing exactly right, and I can't pivot the paper. Anyway, so we keep going. This is called the pivot method of making patterns. This is the dart I want to move. So I come there, I put my finger at the bus point, and I pivot that dart closed. So then as I continue up all the way around, I stop and start at the same place, which is right there. So when I take that away, the bus dart now is actually moved to the shoulder. So that's one way to move a dart. Is It's called the pivot method. Now, the pivot method isn't an alteration method. It's been made into an alteration method. The problem is, is it, it doesn't always work because you don't have the logic behind it. If I want to simply take that bus dart and move it by the slash method, then I simply make a cut down to where the bus point is. The bus point is simply where those two darts intersect. And that actually is the only alignment point of pattern to body. Of pattern to body, there's no shoulder, there's no side seam, there's no waist. All of those things are just kind of made up or created. But the bust point and the nipple are an alignment point from pattern to body. So here we have where I make two cuts. I make one where the dart is, and I make one where the dart is going to be. And I simply close this up, cut them both to a pivot point so that it closes, and then I just use a little bit of tape to tape that close. And you can see that I have moved that dart to the shoulder. Now again, the best reason you need to know that is let's say, for instance, that this is a, a B cup dart, and I've moved it up here, and it's still a B cup dart. Darts are difficult to change after they've been moved. So I'd be better off to go over here, and this is the place I really want to create a bigger dart to fix that problem of making this a larger dart. If I take away from the sides, that doesn't work. So understanding how darts are moved, why darts are moved, and then be able to move them to fix them is really a much better way to fix or create darts. Okay, so let's go back remembering that Darts are always in a garment. In this particular case, the bust dart's been moved to the waist, it's been released, and there is no dart, but the dart is still there. And I could always bring it back. I could always take out the side seam. I can create a dart where that is. All right, so now that we know the basic five pieces, we know how to move darts, we know that there's rules regarding darts, et cetera, et cetera, let's learn a little bit about facings. Facings, by definition, are what finish our raw edges on a garment. So. You know, and it's interesting because in our contemporary garments today, we're finding a lot of raw edges just left. And I like it. I think when I, you first started seeing them, a lot of us older folks said, oh my gosh, that just looks too unfinished. We could never do that. But it really has a very young contemporary feel to it. And it really looks nice. It's a nice alternative. I wouldn't do it on a formal jacket or something like that, but it has its place and I think we should really be open to doing it. But let's talk about facings just for a little bit. If I take a front, which is what I'm going to do in this particular case, and I decide I want to finish off the neck edge, I simply trace the neck edge, I decide how wide I want it, and I connect those two. Very, very simple to do. The, the edge that I'm finishing is the neck edge. And when I look at the final garment, this is what it looks like. That would be the back facing. And if you notice, the back facing is only sewn to the front facing. In this particular case, I completely duplicated the front. But I still needed a facing for the back. A lot of times facings are created, especially in ready-to-wear, for what we call hanger appeal. They want to look nice on the hanger. They want to put a place for the label, et cetera, et cetera. It could be a very narrow facing. In fact, we could just turn the fabric over and stitch. We wouldn't actually need a facing at all. We could just use a seam allowance. But if you're going to decide you want a facing, there's many reasons we do them. You can just trace it, decide how wide you want it. Then we have another facing that's called a fitted facing or a shaped facing. 
that's the fitted facing. This is the shaped facing. And the shaped facing is when we actually now are finishing two edges with one facing. I like this facing. I, I think it, um, it lays better in the garment, the positives. The negatives are that when you have a little fitted facing like this, unless it's anchored down or sewn in, a lot of times it'll flip out. What the positive is when we have the shaped facing is because there's two facings anchored together, so we're tracing the neck edge, we're tracing the shoulder, we're tracing the armhole because that's what we're finishing, and then we're just connecting those two with some type of line. It could be straight. It doesn't make a difference. The sewing and the cutting has to be more accurate in this type of facing. So I'm going to show you an example of this top where this back facing, now again, this is really all about hanger appeal because if you notice, the neckline is low enough that I don't even see anything but the facing when that's on a hanger. But if you look inside, the facing is actually going around the armhole, around the neck edge, and you can see it's all connected. It's actually down into the side seam, and it's all one. Again, this is a great thing to do if you just want your facings to stay in place. The negative is the cutting and the sewing has to be a little more accurate to get this facing to be correct. So the only thing we need to understand about facings is that facings finish raw edges, and there's different kinds for different reasons. But there isn't any reason in the world why I can't just create a facing by copying the neck, the edge that needs to be finished, and then making it the width I want. There's no secret formulas or anything like that. Okay. So let's look at the French kerf and let's look at how it applies to my pattern. Because so many women don't understand the French kerf and they don't understand that if I want an armhole and I want that armhole to be lower, find out where it is on the French kerf and just drop it down. If I have a neckline and I want that neckline to be lower, again, find out where it lays on the French kerf and lower it down. In fact, every neckline follows the French curve. It's simply a matter of where on the French curve it is. If I look at my style lines, so many of us think that style lines are actually straight lines when they're not. They're actually curved lines and they follow the French curve. It's really just our job to find out where on the French curve they are so that we can duplicate them. If you do a straight line on a body, it just won't look as good as it needs to. So let me show you in the sleeve where that French curve applies. And if you notice on the bodice front, this portion of the sleeve and this portion of the armhole are identical. Those will match. And we have what we call a notch. And where that notch is, is an indication of where that French curve has changed directions. So my French curve is here. It flips up and goes here on the armhole. It's here and then flips up this way on the armhole itself. So the sleeve and the armhole are both French curves. They're just opposite ends, and we need to understand that. And then the last two positions of the French curve that are really helpful that we understand is the hip line, because once we drape something and it fits us, we want to duplicate that, and then the shape of the waist. All right, so let's look at center front. And a lot of times what we do with center front, many times we put it on the fold, many times we put it on a bias, many times we add buttons or zippers. But anytime we're adding a button, we have what we call buttonhole extension. And again, you don't have to remember these rules, but I'm going to tell you the rule and then tell you why you need to know it. In this particular case, when I add a buttonhole extension, I add it to center front. And the reason being is so that I can get the buttons and buttonholes right on center front, and when I bring them together, center front will meet, and the extra part will cover behind the buttonhole so that you can't see through it, and it's a place to actually sew the buttons onto. I can't sew the buttons at center front if there's not something additional to center front to sew the buttons onto. All right, so the way this buttonhole front is determined is the radius of the button plus a quarter inch. So the radius is not the, di it's half, of a button. So I'm going to use an example of a one inch button. So the radius of a button would be one half plus a quarter inch. So that would give me a three quarter inch addition that I'm going to add to center front. So the reason that's important is because on the back of the pattern it will say three fourths inch buttons. And if you say, gosh, I don't want three fourths inch buttons, I want one inch buttons. You're going to have to add a little bit more to the center front so that it has the appropriate layover so that the center fronts can be back together. All right, if they can't, then you're gonna find that, that the closure may not be enough. 
All right, another important part of patterns is my grain. My grain, what I know about grain line is that it follows center front. It always follows center front. So notice on the pattern that everything's not following the center front. In fact, the only reason that center front is important is because our bodies are so crooked and what makes us look straight is that center front is straight. But if you notice the neckline is off grain, the shoulder seam is off grain, the armhole's off grain, the side seam's off grain, everything's off grain except for the center front. So we use that and it's really important, but there's many times we want to go askew from that. So I have a square inch ruler and I have one on my French curve. I love this curve because of it. And the square inches will allow me to put one square inch on center front and then manipulate this to where the other edge of that square inch is on center front. So you can see the line going right through that. That leaves me that that is a 45 degree angle and I can create a bias. So anytime I want a bias, I can use a straight line. I can put a square inch at the angle on that straight line and create the bias and know that it's 100% accurate and 100% 45 degree angle, which is what I want. Okay, so now let's look at skirts. Skirts will really give us a lot of variance. There's a lot of variance with skirts, so we kind of really need to understand that. Just before I go into skirts, I just want to mention something that it's kind of misunderstood. Collars and necklines, a lot of times, and we're going to do a, a whole show on collars, so I'm not going to talk a lot about collars today because they're a lot of fun and they have a little more rules that we need to know about them. But with necklines, we seemingly, we seemingly confuse those two. A neckline is simply a position of the French curve that's been changed, lowered, altered, fabric added, and a cowl neck is a perfect example. Many of us think that a cowl neckline is a collar, and a cowl is not a collar. By definition, a collar is an added piece of fabric. So because the cowl neck is just an alteration of the neckline, it's actually not a collar. A collar, again, is a separate piece of fabric that's been added on. And so we actually take it from the front. We'll learn how to do that a couple shows from now. And it, it, it's a lot of fun, but again, you got to know a couple rules. Okay, so collars and necklines, just to not confuse the two, um, a collar is an added piece of fabric. Okay, when I go to do a skirt, one of the most important things in a skirt is to measure the hems because skirts are determined by how many inches they are at the bottom. So if I will take a skirt, and I would, if I were you, go to my closet, pick out the skirts I like, and pick out the skirts I don't like, and measure both of them. And then make a little list, skirts I don't like, skirts I do like, so that you can learn what you like about the skirt and what you don't like. Skirts are extremely easy to duplicate. So what I like about this skirt is the total circumference. So I'm gonna measure what that is, and I find out this one in particular is 36 inches. In this particular skirt, what you notice is the hem is actually narrower than the hip. And that's typically what we call a straight skirt. So in our skirts, if we just look at this pattern here for a little bit, anything that's, that's wider at the hem is called the A-line. Anything that's narrower at the hem is called the straight skirt. Generally, there isn't a skirt that just goes straight down. The only thing that goes straight down is the basic. So we, don't, we generally don't take the basic and just make something from it because there's always fun options to do with it. But what we do do is take the hem. We're going to minus it out just a little bit there, and usually it's an inch on each piece. And then we can just take the curve, and you can see, place it there until it gingerly curves from there to the fullness of the hip and it doesn't change the hip at all. When the hem is narrower than the hip, it really gives us a much thinner look than if it just goes straight or if it goes out. There's a general rule that is said, the wider the hem, the wider you look. So think about that in your dressing when you love those big full skirts. I'm not sure they're gonna love you back. Just keep that in mind. The narrower the hem, the thinner you look. And the wider the hem, the wider you look. But skirts are a lot of fun to play with. There's so many things you can do with them. But just keep in mind that if you measure those hems, you'll really be able to give yourself um, a, a range as to how narrow you want or how full you're willing to go. And the shorter you are, you need to be careful with these really full skirts. But it doesn't mean you can't wear them. You just don't want to make them as full as sometimes when you buy them. 
The other thing about skirts is when you position them on the fabric, it will make a difference as to how they hang. So let's just talk about that briefly. If I put a skirt right on the fold of the fashion fabric, then the fullness hangs throughout the panel. We're gonna call this the, the front of the fabric here. If I then put the grain is what's important. If I put the grain down the middle, then the fullness will hang on both sides. If I put the grain over on the side, the fullness will hang in the middle. So the equation really is fullness equals bias. Wherever the grain line is, there's no fullness. Wherever the straight of grain is and wherever the bias is, you'll get fullness. So I can take the exact same skirt pattern and I can change up the look as to how it will look by simply how I place it on the fabric. Most of the times the skirts are gonna be placed that the grain line goes up the middle. And that's simply because a lot of times if the fullness is at the side, we look wider because all that fullness is hanging at the side of our body. If the fullness is in the center, when we walk, it goes between our legs. We don't like that. But when we put it in the middle, it's kind of a compromise between the two. So that's what most skirts are done. Most skirts are put to where the grain is in the middle of the panels, and that way it's kind of a compromise between the two. But you can always change it up. Okay, let's look at pants. And the one most important thing I'm gonna teach you about pants is how to make pockets. Because I cannot tell you how many women come to me and say, I gotta have pockets, I gotta have pockets, I gotta have pockets, and this pattern doesn't have a pocket. And I always can tell, and I will say we had a recent loss of a great designer, Oscar de la Renta, and one of his famous quotes was, a well-dressed woman never puts her hands in her pockets. That's what handbags are for. So having said that, I will carry on what he has said, but also recognize that a lot, a lot of times we're much more functional than that, and we simply want a pocket. So this is just a real simple thing to do. This is my pant front. This is the only thing I need. And then I need two pieces of, um, just two pieces of paper. These are gonna be your pattern. And you're gonna take these two pieces of pattern. They need to be as long as you want your pocket to be. So if you love deep pockets, a lot of times you buy pants and you put your hand in the pocket and it's just stuck. Like, you couldn't put anything in there. If you sat down or moved, it would fall out. But if you want a deeper pocket, make these two pieces as deep as you want that pocket to be. And I'm gonna put those two pieces behind and I'm gonna cut them down the side equal to the shape of my pattern and across the waist equal to the shape of my pattern and I've already done that. Then turn it to the back and simply cut these two layers in the shape of what you decide your pocket should be shaped like, which is completely up to you. It's your choice, absolutely completely. But for some strange reason, pockets are usually shaped like that, so we're gonna make it like that. But it doesn't matter if it's square, it wouldn't make a single difference. So recognize I've got three layers. I've got my pant, and then I've got two layers, and they're both cut the same shape. Then I take it back to the front side, and I'm gonna put this down. I'm gonna put the back layer down, and that's actually going to be called the pocket. And then I'm gonna take the top layer, even my pants layers, and what I'm gonna do is draw the shape of my pocket. I've actually got a kind of a circular thing there, but I'm gonna recommend that you use a French curve because pockets follow the French curve and just create a nice line. Again, what I can do is I can go to my pants that I wear and I can lay the French curve on the shape of that pocket and I can duplicate exactly what I want. All the French curve, it always has numbers on it, so I can duplicate exactly what I want, and I'm gonna cut both layers the same. So both of these are actually, and you know, a lot of times I show these to women, they say, but I'm ruining my pants. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna take a little piece of tape, and you're gonna put this on, and then when I want a pocket, I flip it forward, and when I don't want a pocket, I flip it back. Is that a deal? That way you won't ruin your pants. But when I want a pocket, which is now, I'm gonna flip it forward, I've got to add seam allowance to both this seam that I just cut and this seam right here in order to keep it like I wanted it. Otherwise, it's gonna make it a little bit farther away. This becomes my pocket facing. I sew right sides together. I turn this all the way inside. And then I come along with my pocket piece. I put this behind and I sew it together here. Remember, it's the same shaping and I have a great pocket. All right, 
It was a company called Eli Tahari back in the 50s that first created darts. And what they did is they put darts in pockets. And one thing they did, I'm going to take this away just for a minute here, is they actually took the top and they slashed it just a little bit over to a pivot point just like that. And they separated that pocket just a little bit. And they did the same to the pocket facing. And what that did is it gave you just a little bit of gap so that when you put your hand, actually before you even put your hand in, it would stand away from the body just a little bit. Now, it's still done in today's pants, but you know what? Doing this or deciding not to do it, I think the best thing about knowing pattern rules is you can absolutely decide when you want to use them and where you want to use them. So no longer do you have to go buy that pants pattern just for the pocket or that shirt just for the facing. Mix and match however you want and it really works out the best for all of us. So we're gonna take these rules and we're gonna deepen them a little bit more. Stick with us on Fit to Stitch. Visit fittostitch.com for all of the patterns and instructions found on today's show, plus more tutorials, webcasts, and techniques from this season of Fit to Stitch. This is show 304. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about fitting with Peggy Sagers, a DVD set of all 13 episodes of Fit to Stitch is available at fittostitch.com for $49.99 plus shipping. Fit to Stitch is made possible in part by Husqvarna Viking, keeping the world sewing for over 140 years with innovations in sewing, embroidery, and quilting. Learn more at HusqvarnaViking.com. American and Eford, innovators of thread for all your sewing needs, makers of Intressa sewing thread. Learn more at SilhouettePatterns.com. Elliott Berman Textiles, manufacturer of fashion fabrics. ElliottBermanTextiles.com